Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mark McClellan. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Evan. Great to be Please, here. Please, Thank you all. Good to have you. Thank you. Oh, great to be in Austin, always. Great. Well, good, good to have you back even uh, briefly. So I had mentioned to you before that I was concerned when we planned this event a couple weeks ago that the news would overtake us and that events would make it so that this was a poorly timed event. Never bet against chaos in Washington. Uh, right. As we sit here, it turns out the timing of our conversation today is perfect because the Senate is going to vote on something, something. <laughs> tomorrow. I mean, I, you know, let me quote President Trump. Healthcare is complicated. Um, who knew? Uh, so I had to look three or four times, and I'm paid to pay attention to this stuff. What in the hell are they voting on tomorrow? Can, do you know what they're voting on tomorrow? It's not clear exactly what they'll proceed to, but the first vote, assuming things do go forward, and these things do change. Right, because there has to be a vote to vote. A vote to vote. Motion so they to have proceed. To have right. 50 votes in favor of a motion to proceed. And so no guarantee as of right now that that's No guarantee happen. that those votes are there. Right. Uh, Senator McCain's out, and without more clarity about what they're voting on next, some right. senators are a little iffy. Right. So assuming that they vote to proceed, then you get to the vote. So initially we thought they were going to vote on a Senate version, and then that didn't work, and then they were going to vote on a repeal only, and then that didn't work. And so if I understand, just before I came over here, I looked it up, what they're going to vote on is actually the House bill. That could, that could still change, though, so this is still, this is still a, a day off. How is it possible to have any, cl I mean, this is the point that yeah. you're, you know, if, if you're a senator, and you're 24 hours or 36 hours or even 48 hours out from having to go in and cast a vote that's going to affect one-sixth of the economy, a bill for which there have been no hearings, and a bill whose language is not really even known to the people inside the building, let alone outside the building, if we're sitting up here confused about what's going to happen, how are they actually going to do this? That's, well, that's the question. Look, two, two points. One is that whatever they do vote on, assuming they do proceed to a vote, is going to be similar to one of those things you've seen before. The House bill, uh, a tweaked version of the Senate bill, right. uh, or uh, just a straight repeal of, right. uh, uh, with, with some delay of, of the ACA. It's going to be something in that family. And then senators, assuming they do have a chance to proceed to the bill, will offer a range of amendments that you've right. also uh, uh, seen before. There won't be any kind of late, last minute, uh, complete surprises. And that's one of the real challenges about doing work in healthcare legislation today. Uh, this stuff is, in fact, hard. And you might remember, uh, this is not the only president or, or administration or Congress that's had challenges with healthcare legislation. Uh, back in uh, uh, the early days of the Obama administration, President Obama went before a joint session of Congress and said he wanted to be the last president to have to sign health care legislation to assure access to affordable, right. innovative, high quality care in this country. Well, that's still we possible. Got, it's still it's possible. It's still possible that he could be uh, the last one, right? I, I, I think there are going to be more. I think this is whatever right. happens this week, uh, Evan, I don't think this is going to be the last word. Right. Uh, this is not an issue where we've worked out how to do all of those things at the same time, affordability, right. uh, quality, uh, uh, access to, to needed care done in a way that is financially sustainable for the country, yep. this issue is going to be with us for a while. Well, and to your point about how this is uh, something that many presidents have wrestled with, I believe actually at the time that Obama was able to successfully get the Affordable Care Act through, there was discussion that there have been attempts by presidents going back yeah. maybe to Truman, at least Truman, to deal yeah. with the health care questions in this country and that Obama was really the first one to succeed at the level that he did, and so maybe it's not a surprise that we're continuing to have a version of this, uh, of this conversation. Do you have a, a, a horse in this race uh, as a Texan? Should we as Texans have a horse in this race? What would be a good outcome for us? A good outcome for Texas, I think, is, again, it's going to be a process. It's not going to be over this week, whatever Well, I guess, I guess well, let me be, maybe a little more yeah. specific. Do we want something to pass tomorrow or not? Uh, I think it could go, I think Texas could do well either way. What Texas is going to need is more steps after whatever passes tomorrow, so, uh, or, or doesn't pass tomorrow. The, the legislation tomorrow, important as it is, is about one piece uh, of the Could U.S. health system. That? So it, it covers the individual insurance markets. Uh, that is about 10% or so uh, of the, the, the U.S. population that doesn't get covered through either a government program 
uh, or their job. Uh, it also has some important provisions about Medicaid that have been uh, probably the more controversial part of the bill uh, uh, even lately. Uh, and Medicaid is now a huge part of health insurance in the United States, covering more than 90 million Americans. It is very important for low income families with kids in Texas, covering more than 50% of births in the state. Uh, it's also important for people with disabilities in Texas right. and for lower income elderly individuals uh, in the state. And to, and to the degree that the uninsured population, Mr. McClellan, Dr. McClellan, has, mm -hmm. has dropped over the last Seven years. Yeah, that's uh, been mainly due to the to the ACA. And it is, and, and mainly due to and, and mainly due to Medicaid being made available to within the ACA that's right. to well, more people. Within Texas, it's yeah. been the individual markets yeah. that's contributed since uh, Texas has not uh, expanded its its Medicaid program. Right. And no question, that's one of the important areas where the ACA has had a positive impact. More people do have coverage, and while there are some real challenges with the affordability. Uh, and some, for some people, access uh, to care under the ACA plans, it's better than being uninsured. The hard part for, for Texas and for the country is finding a way to build on some of the challenges that we've seen in the ACA and challenges in Medicaid. They, again, assure access to quality care at a sustainable cost. And if I could just spend a, another minute on the cost of these programs. So uh, you mentioned in the intro uh, the most important part, that come from Austin and, and all that stuff, uh, but also that I was previously the administrator of the Medicare and Medicaid programs. Right. Those programs this year are going to have a cost of over $1 trillion. Uh, they are by far the largest uh, part, single part of the federal budget for comparison. Uh, this coming year, uh, or this year, we're going to spend about $600 billion on national defense and homeland security all combined. Uh, so this is over 5% of the GDP and, and growing the fastest. So finding a way to make these programs affordable is really important because at the federal level, they're starting to squeeze out spending on things like education programs and low-income yep. assistance programs, things that probably... Uh, do as much, if not more, for the, the long-term health and well-being uh, of the population. At the state level, Medicaid, even though Texas has not expanded coverage, has gone from about 20% of the state budget a decade or so ago to around 30% today. That's without any kind of How uh, much Medicaid of that is expansion. population growth and how much of that is the cost of health care? Well, population, more it's, it's more, I think it's more health care. Um, yeah. uh, the, the population is growing, but the population growth also is important in Texas for things like education spending and infrastructure spending. Those things are getting squeezed by the relative growth in Medicaid. And there's a reason that it's growing, that, that these health care programs are growing. It's partly the demographics of our population. People are getting older, have more chronic diseases. But it's also what health care can do. Uh, health care today does a lot more than it did 10 years ago. It right. cures hepatitis C. Uh, it has treatments for cancer that previously were fatal. It's got much, we've got much better outcomes for chronic diseases, ranging from uh, heart disease to uh, arthritis, uh, you yep. name it. There's just much more that, that medicine can do. And that's also important for Texas. Texas is one of the world leaders uh, in medical technology and innovation, and one of its right. best potentials for growth is in continued support for innovation. Now, you alluded to the fact that Texas did not expand Medicaid. Of course, we in this room know that. We've been talking about for many years the decision that was made by Governor Perry at the time and the legislature not to just say no, but hell no to the idea <laughs> of expanding what they and some others said was a program that was effectively throwing bad money after worse. They said Medicaid is not working. Medicaid is not a good program. We don't want to tie ourselves any more than we already have to to the federal government. We don't want any part of this. You are at a government. You're an independent guy, independent thinker. You know this stuff. Should Texas have expanded Medicaid when the opportunity came up? It's a, it's a tough question. I think in uh, Texas, many other states, I spend time in North Carolina too, yeah. Uh, the politics just isn't there because of these concerns about costs and concerns about the way that the Medicaid program has worked. Are they well-founded concerns? Are, I, I think some of the concerns about the way Medicaid works are well-founded, but I think a reform version of Medicaid could be a critical part, critical part of providing access to care in this state and in many others around the country. And if you don't mind a, a little minute or two story, I can give you an example. All, all we of, have is time. I mean we're good. <laughs> that's no, what, we're that's good. what I love about uh, Texas Tribune. Really. Uh, have a chance to get into the depth uh, Go of get issues. Him. So uh, early on in my days, in the, you mentioned I worked in the Bush administration, I started out working in the White House there. And uh, one of the first really memorable experiences I had was I got a call from the uh, chief of staff, Andy Card, saying, Mark, 
there's a protest going on in the middle of 17th Street and Pennsylvania Avenue, go fix it. I'm like, uh, uh, Secretary Card, uh, I'm not sure you realize this, but I'm the, the, the health policy director for the White House, I don't do protests, go fix it. Right. So it went out there and uh, it was a group called ADAPT that some of you here in Austin may know. Sure. Uh, it's headed by a guy named Bob, Bob, Bob Kafka, who's become one of my good friends. And they were out there in the middle of the street during rush hour in the rain protesting because these were people who had disabilities yeah. who depended on Medicaid for their coverage. And the problem with Medicaid in most states at that time was that it's a 1960s program, which was providing some critical access to care, yeah. but it was designed in a 1960s way. So if you had a disability, you were entitled, entitled to care from a nursing home. You weren't entitled to get the support that you needed to live a productive and independent life and be a contributor to society at the, at the best care, at the lowest cost to enable you to do that. You're entitled to nursing home care, which is great if you're running a nursing home, but not so great if you're a person who wants to be independent despite your disability. Uh, maybe uh, get, instead of getting, uh, you know, uh, uh, $150 a day for, for nursing home care, uh, getting some money to modify your home, to have a part-time home health assistant, to provide a respite for a, a caregiver who's helping you stay active in the community. And you couldn't get that under Medicaid. It was not part of the entitlement. So that protest uh, actually led to some new proposals from our administration called Money Falls the Person, where the idea was not giving an entitlement to the healthcare providers, but giving an entitlement to the people that the program was intended yep. to serve. So based on their medical need, uh, they got something like a budget, they got help from uh, the states that were implementing this program to, to spend it well, and they've been able to get uh, better outcomes in terms of living in the community, participating in, in jobs and other activities, greater quality of life, and lower costs by giving them more control over getting the kind of care that they wanted. That's the kind of re Medicaid reform that I think people like, uh, like the, the politicians in Texas could potentially support. And unfortunately, one of the challenges with the current Medicaid debate is that the focus has been so much on meeting some budget targets, especially over time, and less on what is it really going to take at this point to make Medicaid and other low-income assistance programs for people's critical health needs yeah. work more effectively. That's yeah. a debate that we really have. So you think if the federal government were open to some kind of sweeping Medicaid reforms and the states were able to be at the table in talking about how those reforms would play out, be implemented, and all that, you think there's an opportunity to make Medicaid? There's a bipartisan group of Ma governors, Medicaid including uh, Governor John Kasich, who's been in the news a lot for Governor, this, Governor uh, Sandoval. Governor Hickenlooper, Governor Sandoval, right. who have outlined some proposals and uh, along some of the lines that I've described about shifting the, the Medicaid entitlement from being focused on services to being focused on meeting patients' needs, uh, about uh, enabling things like uh, interaction with private insurance, so it's not like you know, in the, in the, the, the law today, you're 134% of poverty in a state that's expanded yeah. Medicaid. You go up to 136%, you get a completely different kind of uh, health insurance plans. There are ways to do this sort of more continuously for people right. who are trying to work and, uh, but, but, you know, may not be making that much money and need some help, some real help with their health care costs. There also are lots better things that could be done with much of the money, I think, including money spent here in Texas uh, in Medicaid that's not really tied to, to people. So, An example. Uh, so example, that Texas has a big Medicaid waiver. It has three main components. One component of it goes to actual Medicaid coverage. That's actually a minority of the money. Uh, most of the spending in the Texas Medicaid waiver goes to what are called dish payments, disproportionate share payments, to hospitals, to hospitals. that are treating a lot of um, uninsured individuals. And they need that money because right. there are so many people in Texas that are uninsured that are relying on emergency rooms for their critical health care. Uh, there also are, are a lot of funds in what's called a DISRIP program, a, a delivery system reform incentive payment program. And there are over 1,400 now in the state different uh, projects, small projects, local areas with uh, individual providers to try to deliver care better, in many cases, to, to uninsured patients. You know, spend, get them right. out of the emergency rooms, into more preventive care, reducing costs, improving outcomes at the same time. Right now, those those programs, while they're making a big difference, are not really tied into systematically a systematic strategy 
for improving access to care right. and improving coverage for all Texans. And bring those together, I think, could do a lot more yeah. uh, to get value in our Medicaid. Program. Now, that, uh, the, the waiver you referred to, and essentially any other forgiveness that the federal government provides back to states like Texas is always at the pleasure of the administration in office, right? I mean, I remember at the tail end of the Obama administration, there was some veiled threat, maybe not so veiled threat, that you know we need to see if Texas is going to actually embrace the Affordable Care yeah, Act. Otherwise, we're giving this money now, but it's going away. Right, it's going to go away. Mm -hmm. uh, do you, sh should Texas providers, recipients of those funds at the moment, be worried that in the absence of some overhaul of health care provided, they can't get there, and as the president says, we're going to leave the Affordable Care Act in place and let it dwindle? Um, <coughs> should providers here be concerned that those funds are at risk? Uh, they should be concerned that those funds are at risk, but for a different reason. So uh, Medicaid is a program where there is a lot of both um, state discretion and, and how states actually lead this program. They're the ones who make the final decisions about what's right. covered and how and who, but they have to get approval from my old agency, from CMS and from uh, HHS and the, and the federal government. And the federal government has a lot of leeway in interpreting uh, this law. So we could do things like, you know, when I was in, uh, uh, in CMS, like trying to really promote those Money Follow the Person initiatives where yep. people got more control over how the dollars were spent on, on their behalf. Uh, and uh, the Obama administration put a big emphasis on, you know, we'll give you funds, the additional funds now, but they, they really need to be used to transition to uh, right. Medicaid expansions in their version. This administration is, is obviously not pushing in the same direction. Uh, the concern I have, though, is that if you have this sort of partisan approach to Medicaid, you get one administration pushing in one direction, another administration pushing another, like, you know, this one could say, and Texas has asked for an extension uh, of those dish payments that I was just right. talking about earlier, and that's, that's okay. Again, the hospitals need them, but are we really getting to where we need to be? You know, is, if, is it's, a more, it's a band-aid at best, yeah, isn't it? Isn't yeah. there a, aren't there some areas where we could agree more that, right. um, you know, we need to support programs, and, and you know, here in Central Texas, uh, St. David's, um, uh, uh, Seton, uh, Dell, they're all trying to work together with, uh, um, with uh, Austin, uh, uh, with, with programs in Austin, Austin yep. with, with Central Health, Health to, right. to, to, to try to develop a better system for access to basic care for people who aren't insured. Um, there's so much more, I think, that the federal government through legislation and administrative steps could do to, to encourage programs but as like you that. But as you point out, there's a certain amount of uncertainty. Even the best yeah. of those efforts and the best of those collaborations rely on somebody at the other end essentially enabling or not disabling. Yeah, that, that's right. right. And, their and, and that's why... Uh, I mean, one what, of the things I've been yeah. interested in, uh, uh, Dr. McClellan, is that the administration seems to recognize that there may not be enough progress to their satisfaction on health reform, and so I saw over the weekend, for instance, that there are a number of efforts that were in place to encourage sign-ups of the Affordable Care Act, yeah. where now the administration has said we're going to no longer fund those sign-ups. That's right. And so they're anticipating that even if health care reform doesn't pass, there may be things that they can do by fiat to hasten the demise of the Affordable well, there, Care Act. Well, there are unquestionably things yeah. that administrations can do that, that make it easier or harder for programs to succeed. Usually what administrations do is try to you know, shape them right. in, in the direction that they'd prefer. And let me be clear that if what the administration wanted to do was blow up the insurance exchanges, they could do that. They have um, the power to do it. They, they've got the power to do it with these, uh, for example, the so-called cost-sharing reduction payments right. at $7 billion in payments a year, which are at best uh, questionably justified under yep. the terms of the um, Affordable Care Act statute, just like all statutes. They don't get it right the first time. Uh, and uh, the administration, I think, could, its lawyers have told it, that I think, that it could uh, uh, rescind those payments. And that right away would cause a huge increase in premiums, cause, uh, potentially cause right. insurers to withdraw and really disrupt the markets. The administration hasn't done that. Uh, instead, what we're seeing is kind of many states uh, sort of limping along with, with insurance markets that are, are certainly not functioning robustly, uh, maybe just getting by with one or two insurers, having some premium increases, right. but not complete failures either. And that's kind of what you get when you know so both sides don't come together, and and you have this kind of uncertainty is, um, you know, who's in control politically changes in issues like uh, big issues right. like this one. This is what I'm saying. I think we're gonna be we're gonna be facing some of this uncertainty for a few years to come, regardless of what happens this week, this week. In, uh, in Congress. So I asked you about whether Texas should have expanded Medicaid, and you, I thought you gave a diplomatic answer, that, <laughs> uh, uh, probably all I could expect. Um, <laughs> Uh, I am curious, though, about the conditions in Texas that, that we find ourselves in today, despite the fact that Texas did not expand 
Medicaid, uh, we are now at just, I think, just under 17% of our population is uninsured. Mm -hmm. That is down from... I'm, down significantly. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm staring at my friends from the People's Community Clinic who know this stuff mm -hmm. very well. Uh, we're down from 25%, I believe, pre-ACA. I think pre-ACA it was about 6 million Texans who had no yeah. insurance. Today it's somewhere in the vicinity of 4.5 million who have no uh, insurance. Texas is still number one in the country in the percentage and in the raw numbers of its uninsured population, yeah. uh, even after seven years of the, of the Affordable Care Act. Are we at more risk, relatively speaking, do you think, of uh, as this process unfolds in other states as a consequence of that? Those numbers are large. The numbers of people who got insurance in some fashion over the last seven years, despite Texas's efforts to push off the Affordable Care Act, is itself a very large number. A million and a half Texans now have insurance who did not before. How mm. concerned should Texas be if the system blows up and if all of a sudden the protections that those people got somehow over the last seven years no longer exist? Well, Texas should be concerned about yeah. the system blowing up for people who don't have coverage for their jobs. Yeah. I mean, this is a state where a lot of people are in jobs that don't have employer-provided insurance, a relatively high rate of that. That's one reason these numbers uh, are so high. A lot of startup companies, a lot of small businesses, that's right. a key part uh, of the Texas economy. And if people in that whole sector can't get reliable and affordable access to, to care and coverage, uh, that is a problem for the state for economic development. But that's why I think, uh, Evan, that, that you're not going to see this blow up, that we are going to find a way uh, to muddle through one way or another. Uh, my hope and what we're dedicated to at Dell Med and at my program at, uh, at Duke is to find <coughs> better solutions that, that get us past the, the money <coughs> through and just fighting about all of this. Uh, this is really hard to do because of the costs that are at stake, the, uh, the uh, philosophical issues that are at stake. Healthcare is now a macroeconomic issue in this country. This is where it's huge amounts of money on both the, the, right. the public and private side, and there's a lot at stake. Um, there, there's not anything that people really care more about than their health. The, the state has said for some time and continues to say that if the federal government would just give us the money back that would otherwise be deployed in service of solving this problem, if they would just give us the money back, we'll solve it. Just basically yeah. have a stork fly over the Capitol with a big cartoon bag of money <laughs> with a dollar sign on it, drop the bag, <laughs> leave us to our own devices, we'll solve the problem. Yeah. Is, is that for, for what is, is worth, it possible? That, you, you don't need to single out Texas in that regard. I think most governors around the country. No, would my, like job, to say, my job, my job is to single out we'll, Texas we'll, in that <laughs> regard. I am no. absolutely going to single out Texas. But 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 Just give us the money and we know yeah. what to do with it. I think where that that is, is there down, a, is there a solution if that kind of freedom, well, I, I that think, kind of control, were possible? I, I think what would help is if states like Texas could be a bit more clear about what they're going to do with the money. And there are a lot of promising things going on here. I mentioned those disparate programs yeah. uh, before. Uh, that, that's a lot of spots of uh, innovation and care. Lots of the uh, um, hospital districts in the state, lots of the regions in the states right. are taking new steps on uh, innovative and more affordable approaches to coverage that don't rely on sending people to hospital, that rely on things like telemedicine and nurse yeah. practitioners and team approaches to care that are less expensive. I think if the state could do more to articulate what it's going to do and do more to track instead of having 1,400 different programs, have uh, some consistent ways across those programs to show, hey, are they really having an impact on the health of people with chronic diseases? Are they really helping them get costs down? Are people uh, with these conditions getting access to needed care? These are things that you can track in, in 2017. Right. Being more explicit about where the money's gonna go, I think would help uh, get to a, a real bipartisan deal on yeah. what should happen with Medicaid and, and affordable coverage. So tell me what you think of the Affordable Care Act. The Affordable Care Act has been a punching bag since before it was the law. And we could argue with the process that was put into place by Congress and by the President to get to law through and to get to law signed. Peace does seem like the people who hated the way it went through last time are employing exactly the same tactics this time, but that train's already left the station. Let's just accept that the process may have been ugly to get the law passed to begin with. Question is, was it a good law? or was it a bad law? And net-net, has it been a good thing or a bad thing, in your opinion, for this country? I think it's been, uh, and you're gonna say this is another diplomatic answer, I know it already, but uh, it's been good and bad in different respects. The, the, well, um, what made your piece of social legislation in the history of this country has, not been, that has way. been that's perfect right. on day one? None, that, none. Right? none. Right. And, and we have to do something about affordable 
access to care, especially for lower and middle income families in this country. It's, it is not affordable for too many of them now. Yeah. We have to do something also about the overall cost of health care. The reason that health care coverage debates are so contentious is because we have by far the highest costs and growing costs of health care uh, in this country. And I think the best solutions would do something on both. The Affordable Care Act took some important steps on access to coverage. It took some also some, some some steps, but, but not really as far as we need to go on changing the way that healthcare works to make it more affordable and make these programs more sustainable. And that's where the next round of, uh, yep. the next round of uh, legislation should go, both here in the state and nationally. To, to the degree that the Affordable Care Act over the last seven years put more people on health insurance or gave people more access to health insurance, is that enough? That's in the, other words, people yeah. often say coverage is not the same as care. That's right. In Texas, we have an access to coverage problem, but we have a corresponding or maybe separate access to care problem. Yeah. We have more than half of our counties designated as health professional shortage areas by their federal government. There are some number of counties in Texas in which there are no doctors, period. Yeah. There are a number where there are no gynecologists, no psychiatrist, no surgeon. We know that we have a problem on the doc side as well as on the insurance side. My yeah. question is, put, put all this together under the ACA yeah. uh, a, a banner for us, please. Yeah, we, de we definitely aren't there yet in terms of access to care, and there's two parts of that. There's the quality of care that people are getting, so can you get to, if you need to see a, a doctor or get care for a condition, can you get the care? Regardless of whether you have insurance. Regardless of whether you have insurance. Yeah. And then second, how much does that cost? Are, are we giving people, or are people getting that access in a way that's affordable? Just to give you an example, picking up on your point about, you know, there's so many parts of the state that don't even have a, a doctor, let alone a specialist. States like New Mexico have started a program, uh, there it's called Project Echo, um, which is based partly out of Albuquerque, but it involves uh, relying on kind of training up nurse practitioners and allied health professionals in rural parts of the states where there's not a physician right. uh, or at least not a specialist to help people with chronic diseases that require require specialized care uh, to get uh, access to needed treatments, conditions like hepatitis, liver diseases, things like that. And what they've done is rely on not traditional models of trying to support a, a complete hospital or specialist system in these small communities, but telemedicine, uh, a nurse right. practitioner who has direct, easy access and works with a team uh, back at the, uh, at the academic medical center. They can track patients remotely uh, using uh, wireless technologies. Uh, they can make sure that if there is a, a problem that needs to be dealt with, it can be dealt with by an appropriate specialist. It can be done at a fraction of the cost of traditional ways of delivering care, but it doesn't work in traditional Medicaid payment systems where you just pay for the hospital visits right. and the doctor visits. Instead, they had to set up a new payment model where this whole team of providers working together got paid a, an overall right. bundled payment amount to deliver this new mechanism. Well, there's the economic, there's the economic question about that stuff, but there's also a political fight over both scope of practice and mm -hmm. telemedicine that I know you know has been going on in Texas. For and some, those are fights that we need to address to, to solve uh, this problem. For some time. Is the ACA failing? The, the, the president seems to tweet once every couple days, maybe it's once every couple hours, that the Affordable Care Act is failing and is going to collapse, and then he says we're going to put the ownership of the collapse on the Democrats. Leave the blame piece out of this. Is, in your mind, the ACA collapsing or on the verge of collapse? Well, there, let's talk about two main parts of the ACA. So Medicaid expansions, uh, those, the Medicaid expansions have unquestionably, as you point out earlier, given access to many, many more people who would not otherwise have had coverage. The challenge for Medicaid, as I talked about earlier, is how do we keep making this program affordable with other national and state right. priorities? And we've talked some about the steps that I think are really but, important. But accepting to do that. the need so, to make it more affordable, saying that it needs well, that, to be more affordable. My, that's not a major, that's not a minor issue. No, no, but, but Dr. McClellan, <laughs> saying that the ACA needs to be made more affordable is not the same as saying it is on the verge of collapse. My question is, is it on the verge of collapse? I, I don't, I don't think it's on. Says. I don't think it's on the verge of collapse. So let me go on to the other part of the ACA, yeah. which is the individual insurance markets. Right. In some states, uh, like California, the insurance markets are working reasonably in a reasonably stable way. In many states, it is much more marginal. Now, this is not you know, maybe one insurer. And you're talking about insurers. insurers pulling out of markets. Yeah, insurers yeah. pulling out of markets. Not that many people enrolling, especially those who don't have uh, uh, low incomes and get extra help, uh, yeah. especially those who are health. Uh, the result is thin markets with high premiums and not a death spiral, but also not a stable, robust, well-functioning insurance market. We do have examples of well-functioning individuals
individual insurance markets in this country. I was involved in running, in fact, developing uh, uh, some of them, our, our Medicare Advantage program and the Medicare program. Medicare Part D drug coverage has been a, uh, a not very, uh, relatively speaking, not controversial issue uh, for the last decade. That program was created in 2006 when I was, or implemented in 2006 when yep. I was at CMS. Uh, and the only change the ACA made in that program was making the benefits more generous, not changing uh, the basic structure. That's an individual competitive insurance market and that's that working. working well. Yep. So there's some good examples that we could draw on for how to make insurance right. markets work. We are not there now in most states with the ACA. Right. Um, are there aspects of the Affordable Care Act that you think should remain in place regardless of what happens to the Affordable Care Act in the main? So, you know, there's discussion of, well, it's very difficult when you give something to people over a period of years and it becomes popular or aspects of it become popular. When you go in and do an overhaul or a repeal, people go, wait a minute, what happened to that? Often what's discussed is the opportunity to require that people be given coverage despite pre-existing conditions yeah. or the opportunity to keep your young adult child on your insurance for longer than you were able to pre-ACA. Yeah. What aspects of the ACA, what um, components do, do you think have worked and but from your perspective should be retained in whatever plan exists going forward? Well, that last one that you mentioned, uh, coverage for family members up page 26, is going to stay. And it's been very broadly popular. It doesn't cost very much. People, you know, 22 to 25 or so yep. are, not, uh, are not very expensive in the scheme of things. The bigger, tougher ones are um, the subsidies for people who have low to moderate incomes or high health care needs and really cannot afford uh, to get the care that they need on their own. I think those should stay in some form. I, I think that the way to make them much more sustainable is to be much more aggressive about steps to bring down the cost of health care while still promoting innovation and quality. And I'm giving you some examples of that. Uh, and we have to do something about pre-existing conditions. So this is a significant issue now for millions of Americans. If you think about where health care is headed in this country, we're entering uh, what should be, should be an era of precision prevention-oriented medicine, where because of a combination of insights from genomics and the molecular basis of diseases, and I'm not just talking about genetic diseases, uh, um, you know, genetic disorders, uh, uh, I'm also talking about cancer, which uh, very often uh, depends on specific genetic mutations yep. and treatments that can uh, increasingly be targeted uh, to those. Uh, big data, which is enabling us to predict with a lot better precision how a whole bunch of factors, genetic, uh, behavioral, um, uh, 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 so-called phenotypes of diseases all will influence outcomes and enable us to, to tailor treatments much more effectively, combinations of yeah. treatments that really work. That's precision medicine. That's medicine that's oriented towards prevention, like identifying a problem that hasn't happened yet, uh, treating Alzheimer's uh, before the, the brain uh, tissue starts to de degenerate uh, 15 years earlier is when uh, uh, many of those treatments need to start taking effect. That kind of predictive medicine is going to make today's issues of pre-existing conditions look very, very modest. So we right. have to find a way to, to work on uh, right. But on but but if, as conditions. one version or another of these reform uh, bills uh, uh, suggested, states are given the opportunity to opt out to get a waiver on ensuring pre-existing conditions, you believe that would be a bad thing for those states well, and, for I, their, I think, and for their um, citizens? So, so I think what some of the states have talked about is coming up with a different way of dealing with pre-existing conditions other than uh, essentially requiring community rating. And I, I have to say, I've not seen a, a very clear plan from any particular state on, on how to make that work. I think there's some promising directions um, for doing that. Right. Again, let's go back to, I uh, talked about Medicare Part D um, uh, maybe being a, a good example of how to make an insurance market work. So what Medicare Part D does is several things. Uh, first of all, if you don't enroll, there, there's no um, individual mandate or penalty for, for if, you're, if you're not, if you don't have coverage in that program, but if you don't enroll in your first eligible, you pay more later uh, and you pay more for the rest of your life. So that kind of encourages uh, people to, to, to participate. And there is some extra help for low-income individuals so that yep. they, you know, if they're uh, in particular dire straits, they, they still can get help. Uh, second, uh, there's what's called risk adjustment, and I, I don't mean to get technical here, but basically uh, Medicare redistributes a lot more money to the health plans that are attracting and keeping people with high, high drug right. needs and not very much money to those that attract and pe keep people with the, with the low cost. And there's also, you probably heard about reinsurance lately, right. which is, I think is, a, is an important step, but not a solution by itself. It, it, do, it, you know, it does help stabilize markets, but it doesn't really encourage people, the, the, the 
doctors and the patients right. together to find to, to find ways to bring down costs because it just pays more yeah. when you have uh, uh, higher costs. But that combination in Medicare has worked has worked pretty well, and that's the kind of thing I'd like to see in states that want to move away from a guaranteed issue, mandate type uh, approach right. to coverage. Generally speaking, do you think patients around this country are better or worse since the ACA has been in, in effect? I think it depends on the patient. Um, it's, real, <laughs> it it's, real, it's really as yeah. much the case that is patient to patient, not so much yeah, community so the, to community for, or for state people, to state. To some, to some extent, it's, it's community to community and state to state. For people who have pre-existing conditions that, that did not get coverage through their job, it's been a godsend for, for, for many Americans. On the other hand, there are many, many more Americans who just want access to basic coverage and are finding the, the yeah. premiums that they have to pay and, and the, the coverage yeah. that's designed in the ACA just not worth it. Um, the people who swung this election to, to Donald Trump were low to moderate income uh, um, individuals, middle-aged individuals, mainly white in, um, in, in Pennsylvania, right. Ohio, and so forth. They were exactly the people that the ACA was intended to help. Uh, they, they would have qualified, many of them qualified for some subsidies and so forth. What they found, though, is that what they really want, uh, what they really want is better jobs, better health. You know, if you look at outcome trends in this country, uh, our population's actual health, those same demographic groups have, for the first time in the last 100 plus years, seen an increase in their population mortality rates due to violent deaths, due to opioid uh, type overdose, right. overdoses, and primarily due to things like higher rates of death from cardiovascular disease and diabetes. But Dr. McClellan, wouldn't, men, wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't many of the reform bills that have been uh, considered by Congress actually disproportionately harm the very people you're describing on many of the, on many of the areas that you're describing specifically. I mean, the opioid thing is a great example. Mm -hmm. the, the, the community most in need of relief on the opioid issue is the community that would be most damaged, well, it is and said, and by, predict predict by predictions on the outcomes on of this the, legislation. On this point, if, yeah. uh, as we talked about, we yeah. don't even know what the Senate's gonna vote on this week, if right. anything. If they do vote on something and it does pass, I would predict it will have a substantial additional plug of money in it for opioid abuse, right. maybe some additional help in the, in the near term, the next few years for exactly uh, these populations, especially in right. states like Pennsylvania that have expanded coverage. That is not a long-term solution to these uh, uh, societal trends and to the, the worst health that's happening. The point that I'm making is that we need to rethink the way that healthcare works. So it's not just about uh, giving people access to emergency care when they need it, but it's really about much more early intervention. Uh, some of the most interesting programs, let's stick with Pennsylvania, there's a, a health system there called Geisinger that now for some of the individuals that I'm talking about uh, is providing nutrition help, uh, community based yeah. connection to community based services, the things that can really deal with the root cause of the worsening health that's happening uh, rather than just dealing with it on the tail end when people have medical complications. Right. Uh, two quick ones before we go to the audience. We talk about this stuff in great detail for another two hours and not have, <laughs> an, and not have enough time. The CBO has scored many of the proposals that Congress has uh, uh, considered over the last couple of weeks. And the people who want to see an overhaul, either full repeal or repeal and replace, have tended to regard the CBO like a mob accountant, producing a cooked set of books on behalf of those who want to make a certain political argument. The CBO has predicted, I believe, that anywhere from 22 million to 32, 32. million, depending upon which yeah, whether it's repl bill we're talking about, replace or right, just repeal, would, 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 would find themselves and, over a period of time without insurance. That would yeah. be the uninsured numbers would increase by some number, 22 million to 32 million. Yeah. Do you regard the CPOs, the CBOs? You've been inside the yeah. belly of this operation, in from a White House perspective, 10 years ago. Do you believe the CBOs numbers are legitimate, or should we regard the CBO as critics of the CBO seem to as fake news? No, I think the CBO is uh, CBO approaches make for real news because they are objective, professional, uh, well-designed, uh, professional analysts who depend on well-designed methods with a lot of input from experts. I've served as advisor for them along yeah. with people from across the political spectrum. They really do try to synthesize right. uh, a lot, of, all of the evidence and all the perspectives. So if C CBO some, says 22 to 32 million more people will lose their insurance as a consequence yeah. of legislation, take that to the bank. Well, I mean, it doesn't mean you can't argue with the numbers. Uh, CBO has put, uh, for example, in their estimates, they put a lot of 
uh, stock in the fact that the individual mandate uh, is leading more people to get covered. And if you look at some of the actual recent evidence on um, how many people are paying the, uh, the fine when they're uninsured, you know, a lot of people who, aren't, uh, who don't have coverage now or um, are, are not paying uh, the fine have gotten hardship exemptions or something like that. As you mentioned earlier, there's some question about whether the current administration is really going to enforce it. So, you know, it, it's hard, you know, how do you count stuff like that? Maybe the, uh, the, the point is that there, there are reasons you might have a legitimate argument about some of the numbers. Reasonable people can, when they are dealing with complex issues, right. come to different reasonable But generally, you think the CBO is, is, to be, is, to, is to be trusted. Uh, uh, yes, and it, it's a critical institution uh, for guiding legislation. Why are we not talking, before we go to the audience, why, why are we not talking about single payer or some other more radical overhaul of the system. You know, there, it, single payer weirdly is one of these things where the two ends of the political spectrum seem to circle back around mm -hmm. and find weird areas of, of agreement. Is, should we finally be having a serious conversation about a massive, massive, massive overhaul of health care, given everything that's happened in the direction of something like single payer? Well, maybe we'll come back to that in the, uh, in the discussion section. I get this, this question a lot. Yeah. I have to say that you know, in the, the, the most uh, recent debate, when the ACA was originally passing, uh, uh, there was a part of the Democratic Party that wanted to go there, not so much on, on, on the right, on the conservative side, but a lot of moderate Democrats who wanted to try this kind of competitive approach. And you know, I, for one, think, as I've told you before, yeah. I think competitive uh, approaches to care can work well and can deal with some of the challenges that we might have in this country if there was, say, just you know, one uh, um, uh, agency in Medicare deciding who got access to which drugs for the entire country. But let me also say that I think we're, we're headed towards more debate about single payer, but it may not come in the form that you're describing. There are a few states, uh, including uh, Vermont, Vermont, California, that, have, that have tried this, and the numbers look pretty big in terms of taxes that you'd have to raise. I know some people say, well, that's just going to come out of costs uh, uh, elsewhere, and we can talk more about that. I think the more realistic um, path towards single payer is going to be more Democrats moving behind proposals to expand Medicare yeah. uh, to people below 65. So some of the 55 to 64 year old people are having trouble with the, uh, and they are having trouble with the, uh, uh, with the ACA today. Maybe that's a solution for them. Keep expanding Medicaid on, on the other side up to right. uh, maybe higher income levels. And it's not going to be one overnight transformation, but I wouldn't be surprised if there is a stronger push from the Democratic Party in years ahead especially with all the problems that Republicans have had on this debate, if, if that's where uh, uh, there's a more unified uh, uh, push over the next few years. Okay. We'll go to questions. Agnes has a microphone and is going to walk that around to you, and happy to... Ma'am. Hi. Uh, I'm Janice Powers with Avanza Healthcare Strategies. Thank you so much. This has been terrific. Uh, I have a question about affordability. So. I think we can all agree that if the government is subsidizing insurance payments, it's not affordable. Um, in order to mitigate the costs in an insurance pool, you have to get more healthy, wealthy people into the pool. Yeah. Half of Americans get their insurance through employer-based health care. They're healthy and wealthy. What if we just abolished employer-based right. health care and put everybody into the pool? Yeah. This has been yeah. a big topic of conversation. Should we disengage yeah. insurance from work? Yeah. Is that a good, is that should be a component of reform? Yeah, and it's, it's sort of like the, the single payer discussion that we had, you know, let's, and this, this is more on the conservative side. There are, there are a lot of proposals, including, you know, Senator McCain basically ran <coughs> on in, uh, right. in, in 2008. Although it seems to have worked well for him in the last week to have ins insurance tied to work. Well, good, good insurance right. is, I mean, it, I mean, in all seriousness, it is, this just shows you why this issue matters so much to Americans. Yeah. Uh, and there are a lot of people who have employer coverage now who are very happy with it, uh, despite the cost. Now, a lot of the costs are kind of hidden from them because they come in this, uh, the fact that it's uh, a, a deduction for the employer to, to provide this coverage. That's actually our biggest uh, health insurance subsidy in the country. That's worth over $250 billion per year. That doesn't even count in those, that, that trillion dollars that I was talking about with uh, CMS. And these numbers are, these are big numbers. These are, these are very uh, big numbers. <laughs> So, uh, so, so that's one reason that, that coverage works well and that people you know, have formed good pools through their employer. And it's also, I think, the reason why you're not going to see uh, anytime soon a, a big radical proposal to, to take all of that and put it into some kind of uh, new individual market approach. There were some worries when, uh, uh, actually portrayed as worries, when the ACA passed that, hey, there would be a lot of employers uh, dropping coverage. Well, that hasn't happened at all, which I think is at least partly an indication that people who are in employer coverage 
look at what's going on in the ACA exchanges, and they say, I, I don't think I want to be a part of that. I'd rather <laughs> stay over here. I, I'll, I'll yeah. stay over here, thank you very much. And, right. and that's kind of where the politics of, uh, of employer coverage are now. If anything, um, I think employer coverage has become more entrenched uh, over the last few years, not less. Uh, the things that would have to happen to change that would be an approach, uh, maybe a bipartisan one along the lines that I was just describing with Evan uh, for trying to make the individual markets and Medicaid work better and more efficiently. And then once that starts to work well, then well, maybe then more people would be comfortable with thinking about uh, reforms in the employer system. But I don't see that happening very soon in part, of, in part because of you know, what's happened with the, the, the ACA individual market experience. Yeah. 2008 was a much more popular time for uh, these kinds of proposals than 2017. Oh, here's somebody who actually knows something. This is a, a <laughs> Dr. McCourse. Uh, let's focus on access to Medicaid care. Uh, one of the reasons that's given for less than 50% of Texas physicians accepting Medicaid is reimbursement. Is there any really good research data that suggests yep. if we raised yeah. Medicaid reimbursement rates to the physician, one, it would attract more access, and actually right. two, would or would not break the budget? Let, let's put some yeah. numbers on this. I believe that actually the last numbers I saw, Dr. McCourse, only 34% of docs in Texas were taking new Medicaid patients. And there was a fight, at least last last mm -hmm. session, at maybe even this one too, about what the reimbursement rate ought to be. And the legislature, as it often does, goes with the lower number. I think it's like 64, it was like 64 cents was the reimbursement rate. I mean, under that, aren't you basically setting the system up to fail if that's the case? It, 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 it's tough. Um, I would say that the fact that there, you know, there, are, there are some, a lot of doctors who are not taking Medicaid patients. There are also a lot of doctors who aren't taking new Medicare patients or new United patients. Um, uh, this, this is, uh, you know, it's, it's not um, unique to Medicaid to have a lot of doctors uh, not participating. I think the more important thing to focus on if we're trying to keep costs down while assuring access is uh, do the people in Medicaid get the care that they need. And there were some efforts in uh, ACA to actually ex uh, increase uh, payments to primary care physicians in Medicaid, and those did lead, I think the evidence shows that did lead to a, a bit more uh, participation and access. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I don't think the evidence is there that that also led to savings elsewhere in the system. Uh, I think it takes some more bigger changes in the way that we deliver care, especially for low-income, vulnerable populations to, to do that. So there, I look more to things like what Central Health is trying to do here in Austin, uh, uh, switching from relying uh, just or mainly on primary care providers to so team-based approaches of care with nurse practitioners and uh, uh, other uh, 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 caregivers involved in care delivery, supported by better information systems so you can you know, identify the patients that need visits before they show up at the emergency room, stuff like that. That takes some bigger changes in the way that we pay for care in Medicaid. It means moving towards things like team-based medical home payments or, uh, or accountable care organization payments, you know, payments that are really about for a team uh, to provide access to uh, a population uh, of patients. And that's, that's hard to do, but there are some good examples happening around the country. I think that's the most promising direction for affordable access. Uh, I think if we just keep trying to uh, increase uh, payment rates for physicians under a fee-for-service approach, it's just not going to be sustainable. Okay. A question in the front, Agnes, if there's nothing in the back. I'll just speak up. Use your outside voice, please. <laughs> Yeah. leads to you know so many different yeah. um, swim lanes of discussion that it's kind of impossible to really right. get any kind of a uh, you know consensus. Do you think that there's a, another universe where we might approach things kind of one at a time and, and sort of have a sequence of of medic of, of healthcare bills that would come through? So piece, piecemeal as opposed piecemeal. to comprehensive. Yeah, pie piecemeal would be nice. I mean, the, the problem is, it gets back to what we were talking about earlier, is that. Um, to do anything in healthcare in this country these days, you're pretty much talking about macroeconomic implications. I mean, um, this legislation has been extremely controversial, and, and, and it should be because it affects millions of people. 
but it's, it's really affected, uh, you know, we're talking about less than 10% uh, of healthcare spending here. We're talking about only a small part yep. uh, of the overall health system. Even there, it's, it's been really difficult to do. Uh, I, like the, I, I like the instinct, and this is not a country that, um, you know, because most people, especially most middle class Americans with coverage through their jobs or with Medicare, uh, are basically happy with their coverage, or at least not so unhappy that they want to see radical change that could potentially disrupt their access, incremental in one version or another is probably the way that we need to go. And the question is, can you come up with incremental reform approaches that could add up to fundamental change? So uh, I'd like to see in the next round of reform here in the state uh, or at the federal level, more attention, not just to you know, how much money would we like to get out of the Medicaid system by five or 10 years from now, but how are we actually gonna go about doing that? You know, how are we gonna support new models of care uh, or things like Money Falls the Person or other approaches that I think have been proven uh, to lead to, to lower costs and better outcomes that could keep, give people more confidence that these reforms would actually work, uh, or if we're going to um, try to do something less costly, lower premiums in uh, the individual market, right. uh, can we accompany that with steps that would credibly uh, bring costs down? So we're not just talking about cost shifts or problems for access uh, for people with chronic diseases. These are harder. These are yeah. our hard problems, but they're absolutely, I think, solvable. And that's uh, uh, and we've got some good examples of, of yeah. pieces of bipartisan legislation that help with this. The same Congress that's fought over um, uh, the Affordable Care Act all got behind uh, legislation called MACRA uh, a year and a half ago to reform physician payments uh, in the Medicare program because that is so important to, uh, to getting to better care. So I think, I think yeah. it can be done. Th but I, th I think the great implication of this question, though, it's, a, it's an important point, is that at the end of the day, this process of creating legislation that would overhaul health care is no less political in nature and therefore no less suscept susceptible to special interests picking at it than any other, you know. I, I well, noticed so. There's more money. In so I, I noticed. I noticed this morning in the uh, on the Axios uh, news site a chart that aggregated information about how the 70 CEOs of the 70 largest healthcare companies had done from a personal income standpoint over the last seven and a half years. Turns out that the CEOs of the 70 largest healthcare companies have made a combined 9.8 billion dollars over the last seven years. The, the people who run these big health care providers are not going to part with their newfound uh, wealth. Lot, lots of new revenues under the ACA. The, the health care providers have a stake in the system not being overhauled. I mean, and I think it's just one aspect of it, that mm -hmm. if, you go, if you go at this and think about this as a Christmas tree with a lot of ornaments, the tree's going to be weighted down pretty quickly because mm -hmm. everybody's got a stake in some aspect of this. And I just wonder how politics don't infect, at the end of the day, any attempt to overhaul the system? Well, well politics is going to affect uh, system, yep. uh, uh, attempts at system overhaul. And, and I think, by the way, the, these politics should give pause to people who are thinking, well, single payer is somehow the solution. And you're putting kind of all the money into right. uh, decisions will be made by you know, people who are subject to influence by lobbyists and so forth. And have a stake in the outcome of this, a make. financial stake, right? Yeah, so but, but that, that's, I mean, look, that, that's the, the reality we live in. Um, at the same time, as I mentioned, there have been good examples of legislation that have, I think, you know, showed bipartisan interest in moving our healthcare system in the right direction. Um, Congress is going to have a chance to do something like this soon uh, with the, the CHIP program. That's another good example of uh, coverage that, that does get bipartisan support. Why? Uh, it's, for, it's for kids, so, so that's something we can all who, agree. Who wants to be, to be opposed covered. to kids? Who right? wants to be opposed to that? But also, right. if you look at the content of the legislation, it's not as prescriptive as Medicaid on the one hand. It's also not just, you know, here's uh, uh, money, state, do whatever you want with it. It's somewhere in between. People have found kind of a bipartisan way to uh, to support that program, and hopefully it won't get, you know, yeah. the risk there is that it gets dragged down by all the controversies uh, somewhere else. But there are examples of how this can be done. Take one more, Agnes. You've got one back there? No. There's one up here in the front. Ms. Paoli in the front has a question here. Let's have this be the last one. She brought the microphone around. Right here. Uh, uh, over, oh. over here. Oh, I'm sorry. Here, over oh. here. I'm sorry. You have one too? <laughs> we'll take both. We'll, we'll make okay. it quick. Okay, go ahead. Ma'am? Yes. Uh, Mark, thanks for being here today. My name's Robin. Uh, it's a two-part question. Since May, several national polling organizations 
have reported that for the first time since healthcare has been tracked in national polls, it's the top concern that, that uh, Americans are, are naming as their top concern, both Democrats and Republicans. Uh, there's a lot of speculation that it's because people think their health care is going to be taken away. Yeah. I was wondering what you thought about that and what you think the role of the average American citizen can play in this. Yeah. Because average American citizens aren't experts. Right. Is public opinion having an impact on this? Oh yeah, absolutely having an impact on this. That's one reason the Republicans are having so much trouble now, is that look at how they're doing now versus how they thought they'd be doing back in January before those, uh, uh, before those polls change. And it, 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 um, I think that healthcare, you know, it, it's, it's maybe not always number one, but it's always kind of one, two, or three, and the more people get worried about it, the more it moves up. Um, I would just encourage, as we think about these uh, debates on health care, that what that it's very much tied into concerns about the economy because these are like big issues for, for people's well-being. And the more that we can make health care reform about uh, ad addressing the, the true health issues in a population, um, you know, I, I view the, the, the challenge for Republicans is, is how do you come up with a reform plan that would like work for uh, those same voters that were so critical to them in the election. And, and Evan, you talked earlier about, well, won't some of these uh, proposals harm them? Well, well, yes and no in the long term, uh, maybe so if they're just uh, big uh, reductions in the short term, if there's more funding for programs like uh, opioid assistance or uh, assistance for, with insurance for people who want to get a job, they're just not uh, getting paid enough to uh, afford coverage on their own those those do seem like promising directions so uh, it's it's, it's going to be a top issue I, I predict it'll stay a top issue for the next decade plus until we really solve these problems and, and I predict we're not going to do it this week predict we're not going to <laughs> last one ma'am uh, I'm, I'm dealing with it on a personal level the health care system and it's been very interesting researching everything um, I have to understand the health care uh, marketplace the individual insurance Medicare Medicaid and I've done a lot of research mm -hmm. it seems to me the whole goal should be to have healthy, productive citizens. That's, you know, right. <laughs> healthy, productive citizens. That's it. And what is the best, so, so what is the best way to do that? Right. The, the part of this that I think, the amount of human energy, the amount of energy just to understand this and deal with it, it's not just the medical and the emotional part of it, but just figuring it out. I, from my research, I found out that you have, for Medicaid, $250 a month is all you can make to get Medicaid. That's not even food or, or housing, so you have to be on assistance to get that. So I don't know if people realize how low that is. Yeah. $2,000 yeah. a month in resources. I mean, if you have a junky car, you can't get on Medicaid. So, I mean, this is not people that are really, you know, hurting, I mean, uh, you know. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it's, through, it's yeah, an right. amazing yeah. level of, of low. So what's yeah. your question? Mm -hmm. My question is, <laughs> It's, you know, how to make this simpler for the people dealing with it. Because the amount of time and energy to right. just figure it out, I still haven't figured it out, and I've been dealing with it for months. That, that seems I to be a still haven't figured it that out. That seems to be yeah. a bipartisan goal. I think everybody, whatever else they think about the system, yeah. would love for it to be it's so complicated. Easier. So do we and end where we began with the president. Healthcare is complicated. Right? Healthcare is complicated, and you know, I, I I really empathize with what you're going through. I've heard from so many people who have similar experiences. Also, think about you know, for all the people in this room who have tried to help an elderly parent uh, deal with long-term care, which might be under Medicaid or is not covered by Medicare, and then maybe they have private insurance for it. And putting all that together, it is really hard. I think that, and I'll just end on this briefly. Yeah. The fundamental problem with our healthcare system is that it has been designed around specific services by specific providers it has not been designed around people and exactly what you said how do you help this individual get the most out of their life in terms of health well-being being productive contributors to society and i'm a big believer in alignment in our healthcare policies that we need to change the way that we pay from focusing on providers important as their services are to providers in support of achieving goals for individuals that means moving away from payment for specific services and towards payment like i was talking about earlier more at the person level for systems of care, for, for coordinators, for uh, the, the right services, the right combination of treatments for them. And there are some examples around the country of where this is starting to happen, including uh, some examples here in Texas that I hope we can all build on. Good. Uh, we're lucky to have had Dr. McClellan with us today. Give him a big hand. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you all. We appreciate you being here. We'll see you soon. Thanks. Thank you.